Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, on another edition of Wow's Alive, this time from Manhattan Island, uh, with our host, Ned Dennison. Ned? Hello, everyone. I'm an epic marathon swimmer and the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. I'm going to be your uh, interview host tonight, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are. I've got two guests today. I'm going to do the introductions, which I normally have them do because we don't have enough time for them to introduce themselves. Uh, we've got Dr. Jane Katz and we've got Dr. Tim Johnson. They're both honorees of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. Jane is also the person who's received more awards from the International Swimming Hall of Fame than any person alive. And um, I'm going to uh, pitch in immediately with a, a kind of a statement and a question. In 1975, honoree Diana Nyad swam around Manhattan Island. She shattered the course record, which had been in place for about 30 years. It was the 15th recorded swim around the island, and she was the 13th recorded swimmer. Then, with the involvement of these two people and, and others, the entire situation changed and the swim around Manhattan Island became a popular, almost a mass participation event. So folks, what happened? Well, I, uh, Jerry Gallagher had done a practice swim around Manhattan Island and it made the local papers where I lived on Long Island. And I had met Dury through Master Swimming, and uh, I called him up and says, Dury, you should have told me you were going to swim. I would have come and, uh, you know, watched you. And he said, come down next Tuesday. <laughs> and that was like, holy mackerel. I, uh, what if I had the opportunity to watch uh, Dave Horney, Horning swim against the cap. He was the captain of Berkeley, and he swam against the captain of uh, Harvard. And they swam neck and neck looking at each other when they breathe all the way up the Harlem River, turned into the, the um, Hudson River and started swimming south. And then finally, I think, um, um, unfortunately, the name of the fellow from uh, Boston slips to my mind, which is a shame, um, had had too much of the uh, gasoline on the, on the Harlem River and he had to get out. And Dave continued. And uh, and that's when I con conceived of the idea of uh, you know this is uh, this is some fabulous swim and I think we could do it better, you know, because they had a road map <laughs> getting around Manhattan and I'm going I think I think there are better better charts available. <laughs> so Tim, one of your contributions was doing the computer modeling for the for the tidal um, effects of uh, of Manhattan. How what was the state of computing at the time? I, I don't think you were using an abacus, but you certainly weren't using a, uh, a high-powered computer. No, I was using a Hewlett Packard uh, 80, I think it was, um, was the model number, HP. And it was, um, it was, it was the state of the art at that time, but, uh, and I wrote everything in basic. And um, I set it running one day uh, with my loops and calculations in there and I came in the next morning and there was paper all over the floor and I gathered it all up and uh, um, in in my book I I summarized all that stuff with a uh, chart that showed a, a family of curves based on when you start your swim the tide's going to happen it's just your ability to, to um, swim through that that makes any kind of difference whatsoever but the most the biggest contributing aspect of that swim was the tide and so the, so the yeah. course around the island is uh, 28 and a half miles the swimmers are doing it in six to ten hours so the tide is a very significant factor and it 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 only gets better for those that are slower because the slowest person could not possibly come in on that distance of a swim two hours later. And they do because the tide picks up and it pushes them harder than the people in the front. The longer you're riding on the train, the, the more distance you'll cover. Yeah, they did. They did. It was unbelievable. That's right. You know, it was, uh, it, it was a, 
a swim that favored the ordinary uh, recreational kind of swimmer that's just doing laps and decides he's going to go for the big time. Okay. So in your first kind of organized event after uh, the, the captain of uh, Berkeley did away with the captain of some school I've never heard of, um, how, uh, how many people were in that first one? Where did you start them? How, how did it all happen? Well, that started on the Upper East Side uh, and it was uh, um, uh, at 96th Street because that was the traditional spot to start. And uh, Asphalt Green, where Jane swims, uh, had, a, had a launch, had a, like a little launch, uh, launch out there that you could tie your boat up to. So that's where we started to swim. You'd dive off that and then swim around the island and come back to that. Uh, there was some excitement the first time because the police hadn't been notified. We, <laughs> we, were, we were getting our feet wet. Uh, we didn't realize people could uh, take offense. <laughs> well, may I just mention that many people who were not swimmers at an elite level or certainly a, a swimmer for perhaps most of their lives would, would find me, uh, at, whether it was at, um, the Parks Department, City of New York, um, whether it was 23rd uh, Street Pools and 42nd and 10th, uh, Julie Ridge had you know, trained there. There were other people that were learning to swim properly for a long time, which they had never done. 25 meters was, was great. And if you got to a 50 meter pool, that was golden. And so people like uh, Diane, would come to school where I taught at the Bronx for 25 years before John Jay College uh, for 30. So lots of people have, have come to the pools uh, in New York. There are many, sometimes people don't realize there are many, many facilities and, and good ones. You know, they, they are mainly educational uh, facilities, whether it be Fordham or whether it be CUNY, there's 25, pools available and they're all very very good etc so it really it's a misnomer sometimes when people think of one place as you know one and then another and uh i have known uh people from the women's sports foundation like as uh got more women in involved like as it is now but it wasn't that way and, and you were with Dury on one of his first swims. I swam with Dury on his first swim. I was right there. I, I wasn't there at that time. I, I, I had written my first book, Swimming for Total Fitness. I, I had a lot of uh, wonderful oh, people to support it. it. The book's still out. It's 40 years later, et cetera, for people who don't know how to swim yet. And then they continue. And it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to uh, be in Manhattan and just know the swim world. Yeah. And Jane is uh, an accomplished swimmer. We have here one of her trophies from back when. Let's uh, see. You don't have to write about history. You can live with it. Yeah. Uh, so this is the uh, National Outdoor AAU Junior Long Distance Championship 1960. And it starts here, and then we can lift it up because they didn't just give out medals, they gave out furniture. <laughs> and back then, Jane, long distance was what? The three mile this swim. was a three-mile swim, <clears throat> and I was um, 17 at the time. Fantastic. Yes. Um, tell us about the evolution of, of Manhattan. You, you started it um, on the Upper East Side. Um, certainly when I swam it, it was on the, down by the Battery somewhere was to start. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they started today. Did, but, the, but, did the starting position change over time for reasons? Yes, it did change over time for reasons. We, uh, we would run the swim. And um, going up the Harlem River, and it was a very tight group. It was very, you know, just the, the Harlem River was just starting out to change its current flow. So there was not that uh, big push. So faster swimmers got maybe two miles ahead. But by the time they got to the end of the Harlem River and things had started picking up, they would dump off into the uh, Hudson River, and everybody would start catching up with them. 
because the, the Hudson hadn't quite started its flow. And then by the time they got to the George Washington Bridge, it started picking up. And by the time they got down to the uh, lower Manhattan, the current was pushing them very, very fast, but it hadn't picked up for the back of the pack. So the pack spread out. It could be as many as five miles long. And we would go around the battery and every crossing for the swimmers at, at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal was an issue because we had to time it so that the ferry could get in without putting the brakes on because they don't have any brakes and not lose a swimmer. So it became a very challenging thing. And finally, we, myself and uh, uh, Benson Huggard experimented with the start where one of the early swims had been done and we discovered that we do as a group, one crossing of the Staten Island Ferry, negotiate that, everybody goes by, the ferry's happy, we're happy, and then we finish up just shy of crossing it again. And we, it, we, it, it eliminated a big, big problem. So it, it wasn't so much to get the most advantageous tide, it was to avoid the, the collision, the, to avoid the conflict with the ferry, which really drove the starting so they, position. They, they, could, they could pull the plug on the swim. Um, and and how, how, many, how many city, state, federal, and intergalactical agencies were involved eventually in getting approvals for these swims? The, the one that counted was the one with the Coast Guard. If the Coast Guard gave you the permit and you satisfied all their questions, everybody else had to fall in line. The, the, okay. And they would come along and uh, the city police would lead the parade. And it's considered a Marine parade. They consider it a Marine parade. So okay. they would take the lead. And uh, we would, we would uh, make sure they were supplied with a can of beer, uh, make them happy, and they would go off. And they, they didn't bother us. They were there for emergencies. And, uh, you know, the safety factors started uh, coming along as the swim grew older and longer and uh, we, we learn you only learn by doing it the lessons you know I uh, there's much larger swims it turned out we kind of type topped out at around 50 swimmers because we couldn't handle the radio communications and maintain uh, control of the swim it, it just became uh, an annoyance uh, the okay. radio so so for the viewers who are not familiar, a couple of things. When, when you're talking about 50 swimmers, um, each, each swimmer in the water had usually a dedicated kayak, and each swimmer in the water had a, had a safety boat. Um, so we're talking about a tremendous number of volunteers and a tremendous number of watercraft to do a swim okay. of that size. Up, the VHS on the Hudson River would get out of contact. You can't talk to the guy in the back and the front. So we had the radio ham radio operators, and they had a longer reach, and they were a very valuable uh, addition to the swim in the early stages because of that. They're great guys. They did a lot of volunteer events, and they loved working with us. Okay. Let's, let's come off the swim for a moment. Um, you're also a well-known historian in the sport. Um, you have the book in at least two, two editions, which I'm familiar with. Um, I, one of the questions I, pr I, I, I posed for you ahead of time was, who was your most interesting character from all of the history that you, you researched? Well, one of the fellows that uh, really uh, appealed to me was Steve Brody. And uh, as part of my homework, which I didn't do, uh, I was supposed <laughs> to read what I wrote. <laughs> You could probably make it up and get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> it was all it was all about bridge jumping. Bridge jumping, as you realize, was a com you don't think of it as a sport, but uh, sailors had a long time been jumping off the mast of their ships. You know, when you're in the you know calm at sea at anchor and stuff like that, they have nothing to do, so they dive. You know, not just dive from the side of the ship they go up on the yards and jump from there so there was uh, uh quite quite something and then when they they opened the brooklyn bridge in 1883 it cost three cents to use the bridge yeah. 
<laughs> it's free now. They could have waited. <laughs> uh, and there was a swimming instructor named uh, Robert Oda. He was the first man to attempt jumping off the bridge. And he lost his life jumping off of the bridge. You know, uh, there was a skill to bridge jumping. And uh, Captain Paul Boynton was rumored to have been involved in that attempt. Paul Boynton was the swimmer that predated uh, Webb. Uh, and he did an exhibition swim across the channel to prove that it could be done. And he uh, got quite, he was quite uh, an illustrious uh, uh, swim person through history. And he went through Europe getting awards, went to South America. He'd swim in rivers and uh, and gather accolades, and uh, then he came to the United States. When he when he swam down the Hudson River, he was the first one to think of that. Uh, there were ice chunks in the river because it was early, but he had on a swim flotation suit, and it didn't bother him that much. And when he came into the New York area, people were on rooftops, standing there to see him come in, and you just go, well, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> I think we I think we have to add that in addition to what we probably think of these days as a um, as a, a total immersion kind of dry suit, he he also had a sail attached to his boot. Um, so when we talk about swimming the English Channel, he was incredibly influential. He's an honoree of the International Swimming Hall of Fame and an early pioneer of the English Channel. But the difference between what he did and what Captain Webb did is, is substantially different. I know. Yeah, but I think they both drank. <laughs> I suspect so. Um, so I had it. <laughs> yeah, and so, then, so, so so we had this Professor Odom, and that I just mentioned you, some of these historical figures touch each other, and this was a case where it was, and uh, in uh, there was a jump in 1886, uh, which was uh, just a three years after the bridge opened and uh, it was it was done by Steve Brody and he was motivated to do this jump because there was a wager of two hundred dollars on it. Which is a lot of money back then. You know it was quite a bit of money. I don't know if I did a translation on it. Uh, and you can buy your way out of the Civil War for less than a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> He once shined shoes and sold newspapers in the Bowery, you know. He was, uh, he, uh, was appointed a lieutenant in uh, the famous Life-Saving Corps organized on the East River waterfront because people would just, uh, you know, the piers that we don't dare go near when we're swimming around Manhattan, they would jump off and swim in the, in the still waters between the piers. So he was part of that. And, uh, you know, he had trained from jumping from High Bridge in the Harlem River, which is pretty high for this. Nobody cared if he jumped up there. But if he went down to Brooklyn Bridge, uh, he, he, he gained two columns on the front page of the New York Times. Now, the Times, this article, I, I, I reference this in my book. And if you pull that paper, it's a fabulous highlight of this swim but they really give you a look into who Steve Brody was. And I always thought that this was the most fabulous writing I've ever read for an interview, because you can just see this guy in jail, dis distraught, worried, you know, and everything else. And um, he, he turned that around, you know, when he got released. Uh, I don't know how long he had to stay. And he started a career at a sideshow in Coney Island which was Boynton again, because Boynton ran that. <laughs> uh, he exhibited himself at a, at a dime museum while on the Broadway. And then he opened a saloon on the Broadway. On the Bowery, I'm sorry, Bowery. And, Close uh, by. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the saloon featured a mural of his jump behind the bar, along with a certificate from the barge captain that retrieved him and, fam and famous pictures of that. And he wrote a he wrote a play about his events, you know, and it's called On the Bowery. And later on, George Raft starred in that 
when it was finally recorded, but he would go around and do these plays and stuff. Fantastic. Uh, uh, it was. If you're, was talking, you're talking about famous people intersecting. Uh, one of our honorees was named Bill Gohl. He was a, a famous swimmer. He was in the Manhattan race, I think in 1930. I think he got third. He yeah. then was, during the Great Depression, he was a stunt swimmer and diver to earn money and competed in the Canadian National Exhibitions until I think the late 1950s. So there were some people who made their living in those days out of swimming and entertaining. Um, and it's interesting how, you know, there's the same kind of style as, uh, as uh, Mr. Brody. Mr. Gold was a bit of a entertainer, swimmer, performer for decades. <laughs> It's almost addictive, and I, I, I couldn't say that I did not notice that in some swimmers, that uh, they would do not necessarily stunts, they would do, let's just say there was one swimmer that would swim across the London um, um, swimmer. He would do swims uh, under bridges, so he would, he would come into New York and contract me, and we'd, we'd set it up for a swim, but he'd first swim across San Francisco Narrows, the Golden Gate. And then he was off to London to swim, um, I guess, under the Linden Bridge or well, however he wound it up. But he did it all in one day. Um, and that was quite, uh, quite interesting. So um, Steve Brody um, had uh, also did another event that was... Uh, you, well, the, the, the Brooklyn Bridge was considered, some people considered it a hoax because the last guy that jumped off died. Why didn't he die? So there's, I, I just think he had, because he had practiced and he learned how to land properly, he, he could survive it. And we, I think we see the swimmers down in Acapulco diving into the waters. Much more dangerous, I think, because you've got to wait for the wave to come in <laughs> to get enough water. But... Uh, he went over the falls, the Niagara Falls, the first person to do it and live it. That was in uh, 1889. And he was arrested for going over the falls. Presumably he was in some sort of barrel. He is actually in Paul Boynton's swimsuit. I okay. Think, you know, uh, he used that. He struck the bottom at the base of the falls. He regained consciousness and passed out. He woke up floating somewhere downstream. <laughs> Uh, and uh, as he was attempt as he was leaving, he got arrested, and uh, it was quite a bit of uh, rigmarole before the court, where they says, "Will you admit that you did this, and we'll let you go?" And he says, "If I admit that, do I do I have to deny it and stuff like that?" So he went through a whole court case, and he got fined because he wouldn't deny that he jumped off it, and it's all in the uh, court system and the. This is, this is not even recognized up in Niagara Falls. They, they found a woman that went over in a barrel. So that uh, they say she's the first. But here Brody was arrested, you know. But maybe he went over to Canadian Falls. Um, so that was one, the other thing that he did. And then finally, the thing that, uh, the reason I think of it is a hoax, he would do these plays. And on one play, he went to, um, Chicago to give the performance. And then I think he had, uh, he's returning by train on, um, in, let's see, let me get that date. He was returning on March 30th from Chicago when the train conductor could not revive him. So they reported him as dead. And, uh, they called his wife and, and she notified the New York Times that Steve had died, you know, probably from drink. Now, he was not the first swimmer to die from drink. The first one in my book died from drink. Uh, he was probably bad whiskey, you know, whatever they gave at that time. But uh, so the New York Times printed his obituary the following day, April 1st. And here he comes into the bar in the Bowery with the paper <laughs> reported of his death. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you just go, uh, and when I read this, and it was reported in the Times, 
I just started laughing. I just started oh, yes. because you're always in this thing where you want the newspaper coverage, but you don't want it and stuff like that. And he got that to print that he had died. <laughs> and yet he was alive. So when he really did die, and he died, uh, let's see, in 1901, New York are you, Times. Are you sure? Sent the, <laughs> sent the reporter all the way out to Arizona to stick his body with a pin to make sure he was dead. I'm, you know, and you just go, my God. Uh, he later moved up to Buffalo and opened a theater, you know, got legitimate. And, uh, <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, that, uh, that story is obviously in the book as well for people. The book's still in print. Um, one last question for you, because we, we only have time for one more. About three years ago, um, my, my co-host, Steve Munitonis, who, who famously did go to that school called Harvard, which I, I did an innocent dig at earlier. Mm -hmm. Steve Munitonis was contacted by the granddaughter of a woman um, with some history of Manhattan. And she had a, a, a box of uh, media clippings and old relics that her, her grandmother had kind of never shared with her. Steve started um, printing some stories about it. The story was a bit fantastic. Um, he convinced me to take a look at it, and I went, uh, maybe. And she was famously in your book as one of these maybe she swam, maybe she didn't swim characters. Yeah. So the last thing we wanted was to gather a brick from the famous historian Dr. Tim Johnson on this whole thing. So we asked you to take a look at it and either sprinkle some holy dust on it or stick with your original conclusion. Tell us about what you did to, to basically verify that swim 100 years later. Well, thank Steve, the family that contacted Steve did well because they had supporting evidence of uh, other newspaper reporting. Um, I had a mostly relied upon the New York Times for my reporting. So if the swim was reported in a local uh, newsprint, I didn't have access to it. So I, I couldn't uh, know of it. Uh, I know um, that um, what I had seen of it, there had been some measure of that reported and it was associated with a, uh, a how would you call that, a uh, exhibition kind of swim, mm -hmm. where a person says they did a, did a swim, but they didn't really do the swim. Like, I, I can say I swam around Manhattan, but actually I only swam around from 96th Street to the uh, George Washington Bridge. Uh, it's around, but it's not a circumswim. So, uh, but, so I uh, looked at it. I didn't find any other supporting evidence. And I said, this is an also swim. I had a special section for the pretenders. Um, and um, that's so, you know, you have to look at it in a historical way. And there was enough information in those local papers that I could go back in the tide tables and verify that at least the current was flowing in the right direction at the time she claimed she swam. I couldn't verify the time or anything like that, but that was done by the local newspaper. So at, at that point, yeah, she did it. Uh, I don't know how or, or, you know, so, but it, well, I, I know she did it by using her arms and legs, right? <laughs> she swam with her arms and legs. But uh, the nice thing about the Manhattan swim is you can go very slow and still finish because the tide cooperates. And uh, you can also rest. I, uh, there was one swim I was on where the swimmer, <laughs> quote unquote, cheated. He, he grabbed a hold of the boat, boat, the back of the boat, as it was floating down the river and had a sandwich and he broke a minute for the hundred yards in the Hudson. <laughs> and I, was going, oh, I wish I could say I could broke a hundred, but uh, <laughs> a minute for but there was stuff like that. And she did it. And uh, I got to credit her to that. And uh, I'm glad the family came forward, you know, yeah. and, it, and it, even in the uh, start of the history of swimming, I say, this is not a com complete compendium. And there could be other things that are needed uh, addressing. Uh, the woman's name is Ida Elowinski. The proud granddaughter was Joanna, who pr provided the information. And the uh, Ida was inducted into the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame last year. 
She was the second person to go around Manhattan and the first woman. And if I remember right, she beat the man's time. Yes, just to uh, <laughs> foretell Gertrude's Ederle's Ed attempt right. to cross the channel. Right. You know? so, I had met Gertrude over the, over the years, even when she was, you know, finished with her big swims and growing up in the Lower East Side that you've mentioned many wonderful places is, is where she had her ticker tape. When, when she did so. so. The, first, the first ticker tape parade ever in the history of New York City, yeah. and you can still see this on YouTube. Anybody who doesn't watch this once a year is not interested in the sport. It just, it will make the hair in the back of your neck stand up. I'd like to thank you too. We've kind of reached the end of our time. Thank you for bringing the history to life. And maybe Jane, when we have a little more time, we can talk about the time you met Tarzan down in Florida. But that's for another time now. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> right. Take care. Bye. Bye.